Thank you for the intro, Anshur. Um, so yes, uh, we're talking about LLMs and um, maybe to begin with, uh, I would like to see a show of hands like how many of you are playing with LLMs at this moment? Cool, so at least I would not be um, sounding gibberish to you guys. So yes, my name is Atita Arora and uh, I work at Quadrant at the moment and um, working as a solution architect. So day in, day out, my work involves with uh, talking to people, uh, clients who are implementing and uh, leveraging LLMs to solve um, their business use cases. So that's a bit about myself. I've started uh, working in search and data since 2008 and uh, particularly very, very interested in vector semantic search, language analysis. I'm also a committer um, on Apache OpenNLP, uh, contributor on Solar as well. And um, I love to travel, eat, cook, and mother as well. Um, so I think I'll, I'll start from here because I guess uh, I don't need to convince you like how quickly everyone seems to be adopting generative AI at the speed. There's this one um, maybe study from ENY which is done only for uh, India, but I guess it's pretty much relevant for all across the world. We're seeing that people are building and leveraging uh, LLMs to build different kind of assistants and different kind of chatbots. Uh, Majorly, if you sum this up, more than 60 or 65% of the use cases involve something like uh, RAG. So RAG, I would also cover in uh, the forthcoming slides as well. The idea here being that um, anything that takes away the pressure of anyone being present personally, but uh, automating the customer uh, chatbot sort of a flow. And this is the impact radar for generative AI. As you would see in the center, you would see that the most focus from the period of like now to the next one year is very high on generative AI enabled virtual assistants and also like hallucination management and uh, something to do with LLM chains and stuff. And I guess that's what you guys are probably doing as well. So, which is why it makes sense to talk about like the challenges that one would um, tend to get into when they start working with LLMs. So that's like revisiting retrieval augmented generation, and that's in short called RAG. So as you would see that it comprises of four different or four main components. That's called ingestion, retrieval, synthesis, and generation. So as you would see that we would start with a document, a pretty large one, and we would break them into small chunks. And I think this has been like one of the pain points that uh, finding out like how big the chunk should be, how small the chunk should be, what should be the chunking strategy, or how should basically we split the document text. That has been like a question of the century, I would say. And then after that, we would um, encode and index this into something called a vector database. That's the kind of company that I work for, Quadrant. Um, I don't want to kind of make it more like a you know, hook for the Quadrant at the moment, but then the, this is like one thing that has been a key enabler of... Uh, uh, providing uh, and um, uh, basically sourcing the applications which are based on LLM. The idea being that as you must have interacted with ChatGPT, uh, a user is basically querying uh, the LLM directly, and we basically intercept it in between by providing a more contextual information, which is retrieved from something like a vector database. And the idea here being that we call this component as a knowledge retrieval and answer processing unit. So there could be a lot that could go in this you know, knowledge retrieval and answer processing unit, as we see on this slide. So we've seen like a naive implementation, but there are many more, I would say, complicated or complex you know, flows with the variation on different chunking strategy, different kind of model fine tuning, uh, different ways of query rewriting and advanced uh, retrieval strategies. As you would notice that most of this still involves our classic flows of the information retrieval. So for example, the first flow with the naive rag, as we would notice, we would see that we're usually uh, interacting and uh, doing everything with user query and documents itself with no rocket sciencey things or no complicated features on the retrieval side. And we would basically use one fixed sort of like LLM and would uh, output the answer to the user. But this could obviously be implemented in various different ways by uh, massaging the content, by doing query uh, you know, uh, cleaning and uh, query enrichment, query relaxation and different kind of information retrieval strategies. And then after post uh, retrieval stage as well, we could work with something like um, document re-ranking, document summarization, and something like fusing the rank of um, 
the lexical search and the vector search together. And then I'm sure you must have also seen something like DSPy, which has been taking up the internet with a storm. So basically, what I wanted to show here was that things can really go complicated when you're interacting with an LLM, and which is why you would see that uh, I mean, we need a discussion like this. But before we discuss that, we need to understand that why LLM-based applications are becoming such a rage. So to understand, I put here like some factors. So obviously, it saves time once you've automated the flow and once you have understood like how can you uh, integrate this in your architecture. This would basically be a big time saver. You don't have to do uh, all of these things that an LLM has been trained on manually. So definitely a big time saver. Big cost saver as well because you can have a multilingual implementation that can save you cost of not maintaining multiple different architectures. As I said, multiple many times. Uh, multiple applications is like something that um, it um, basically masters on. You could have co-pilots, you could have uh, customer chatbots, you could have research assistants and whatnot. And above all, uh, all of this information is very contextual. So the contextual part is something that is sourced by a vector database, but then the idea being that uh, the information could really uh, be like something that's coming from an LLM itself. So it enhances also the engagement because the customer is getting all the relevant answers. It would want to, they would want to interact more with your system. And something that has been like a big burning you know, concern of the information retrieval system is like being multilingual as well. So with different uh, uh, kind of implementations, like for example, using a multilingual embedding model, you could also make these implementations multilingual. And above all, the factor that has been um, a very, uh, I would say, uh, grave concern is that we want to keep them grounded because we are providing our own proprietary data to uh, build such applications. So all of that was really amazing, and I'm sure, which is why all of you have been trying to work on um, LLMs and LLM-based applications, but there are definitely some challenges, and what I did here is that, first of all, I also wrote about this uh, at uh, Superlinked, a vector hub, um, and on top of it, I broke down the challenges based on each of these stages. So with retrieval, we could have relevancy issues like any traditional information retrieval uh, issues with uh, precision, with recall, where the relevant documents are not retrieved. Once the information is not retrieved, obviously you cannot even generate a relevant response. Along with that, there is something called lost in the middle problem. Of course, we've had a situation where uh, people want or people... Uh, kind of, you know, want to embed the entire document into one chunk. And seems like the LLMs have the tendency to basically forget about, you know, everything in the beginning and in the middle. They would only remember, just like a human being, would remember only what has been told to them recently. So that's the phenomena that was being also discussed about in one of the papers, which is actually in the footer note of this uh, slide. Uh, so lost in the middle problem is, again, something that has been affecting retrieval um, of the uh, relevant information. Then the augmentation is another thing which is problematic because you could have information, something like that depends on the temporal uh, factors, like the recency and, uh, for example, uh, information about um, you know, presidents or prime ministers. And if you're retrieving like the outdated information, that's also problematic. Along with that, sometimes missing context or ambiguity, like each word uh, can mean different things and what to retrieve at that point in time would also become a problem. Like finding a relevant relationship between uh, what the user is querying for and what the information we are retrieving for. So along with that, we have the generation issue. I think hallucination I have in my life in uh, last one year have heard so many times like hallucination. I thought it used to be a mental problem, but now I would uh, say that hallucination is something that people are associating with LLMs. And the idea here being that uh, hallucination is not really a big word, but more like in simple words, when a correct response is not rendered by LLM, it's called to be hallucinating. Then we have biased answers as well, and that totally depends on the kind of data that we have used for training that LLM, which becomes also problematic when it starts giving out harmful and inappropriate responses. Along with that toxic tone, uh, gender biased comments and stuff, that becomes really, again, a big problem. Along with that, we would want LLMs to respond the way humans do. So diversity of response. I mean, imagine like when you would go to a customer uh, help desk, they would not respond big back with the same answer all the time. I mean, there would be a change, there would be a diversity in the responses, and that is the same thing that we would want to achieve with LLMs as well. So you must be wondering, like, 
I mean, it is not relevant. Why are we even discussing about it? LLMs are perfect. I mean, it's a perfect word, the perfect data. And how can these challenges even affect us? So imagine, I'm sure you must have seen this all over uh, Twitter uh, or X, if I should call it, last, last week, where Google has been recommending people to eat at least one rock a day. And people who were uh, asking about, like, my cheese is not sticking to pizza, Google prescribed, you could use glue. I mean, don't try it out. And these challenges could go way far than imagine um, Google suggesting gasoline to cooking spaghetti. And parachutes are not effective, so what not. So it can basically drive you crazy. So which is why what we suggest is that you should basically look at these core challenges in a more broader way. So there's this very nice article where the person speaks about 12 pain points with the resolution. And I know this picture looks kind of really a lot. I mean, it's taking up more than half of my slide, but which is why I've also summarized here that uh, the focus point is that you need to focus on providing clean data, which is probably like the rule of thumb for any information retrieval issue. Focusing on data processing, again, something that comes from information retrieval as well. Give retrieval algo some love, again, information retrieval. And the last point about focus on embedding algo and the language models. So here, the focus being that your embedding model that you're using for your particular use case should be effective for your given use case. So if you're using something to build on top of like a finance data or medical data, you should make sure that the embedding model that you've used understands all the terminologies and jargons that are used in that particular domain. Similar also goes for the language models as well. So which is why uh, this is something that I highly recommend you look up. And uh, moving on, uh, there are some uh, rack performance you know, improvement uh, statistics or methods as well. So you would see a lot being kind of you know, repeated uh, from the information retrieval improvements as well. So for example, focusing on your data cleaning, focusing on how you're chunking the data, focusing on adding metadata that describes your data well, this is all something that we used to do on, uh, when we were building information retrieval systems. I have repeated this uh, on my previous slide as well, like focusing on the embedding models. Uh, this is something that I have had with uh, a practical example as well, like modifying the retrieval window size, like try things out with retrieving more context and less context. So try things out with, for example, retrieving three chunks or five chunks or maybe two chunks. And I would show you that there are some practical examples as well. Also modifying maybe indexing algorithm. So with indexing algorithm, I meant that uh, you could try building something like a HNSW, something like lexical uh, indexes as well, combining the strategies or even using multi-indexing. So even using images for it. So multimodal RAG is kind of, again, something really hot. Modifying uh, different um, LLMs. So I've tried things out with Mistral, with OpenAI, with uh, Llama 3 as well. And another thing that uh, basically has been very effective is also by re-ranking. So by applying re-ranking based on, uh, for example, your query and your documents and re-ranking based on um, the re-ranker model. Again, I would be sharing a Git repo where I've tried all of this, which probably would be useful for you as well. So the whole idea is that we focus, we want to focus on is that evaluation is something that would come to your rescue. So you should obviously always evaluate, and we've been evaluating all our applications all this while. It makes much more sense because for our traditional applications as well, we have always evaluated because we wanted to establish like a trust and reputation and confidence in uh, what we have built before shipping out. We want to make sure that uh, the use case basically correlates uh, the uh, output with respect to the expectations from the use case. We also want to make sure that the application is avoiding common pitfalls. We want to make sure that whatever we are shipping out, not like Google, we can make a good go, no go decision. I'm sure they have not spent on evaluation. Maybe that's why we're seeing those responses. And if not any of these, it can at least provide you with a roadmap for improvement. So this is like a basic framework that I also wrote about in um, the same uh, series that uh, we could start with something like a model evaluation because we want to make sure that uh, our model understands the domain well. So start, start with a model evaluation and then uh, focus on um, the data processing or data ingestion evaluation. Along with that, we also focus on like the semantic retrieval evaluation and on top of it, the entire process, which is also broken down into like retrieval augmented generation steps. So the whole idea is that our evaluation metrics should be measurable, should be reliable, 
and should be accurate, something that reminds me of SMART goals. So how can you basically do the model evaluation? And please let me know if I'm going very fast, I can slow down. I know I have 30 minutes, but I want to make sure that if people have questions, I can take them up after the talk as well. So starting with model evaluation, um, we could probably start with this leaderboard, which is, again, open source. You can add your own embedding models as well. So it basically uh, evaluates your embedding model based on different criteria. It has a total of uh, 159 data sets with the covering, coverage of 113 languages. And there are about 310 models here. And uh, it has been basically uh, evaluated on um, 11 tasks. So it uh, basically talks about and compares the model based on embedding dimension. If you want to go for a smaller model, uh, it can also talk about, for example, how many tokens can it process? What is the classification uh, capabilities? What is the clustering capabilities? What is pairwise classification re-ranking capabilities? So you can go to that link and find out more. But it has been like a lifesaver to me when I'm uh, building a new rag. I mean, this is the first thing that I would always you know, consult uh, to begin with. So the idea is that we're establishing that our model that we're using to build RAG is fit for purpose. Uh, let me rephrase, not RAG, but more like a generative AI application. So if you're using custom model, you can also still uh, evaluate all of that because uh, this thing is like pretty much open for the uh, custom um, model evaluation as well. And you can choose your task that you want to evaluate on. For example, if your use case requires something like a classification capabilities, you can, uh, class, you can um, basically evaluate it on uh, the classification abilities. If your model is more like a re-ranking model, you can evaluate it for that as well, or for summarization, because I believe that each application serves like different use cases. So again, the idea being that we need to establish that the model that we have uh, custom trained or we're using off the shelf is fit for the purpose that we're building this uh, application for. So then comes our data chunking process where I know it's kind of like something that we need to focus on that we, uh, we can pick only two of these. Uh, if we want to choose it for like the relevancy and accuracy, we want to choose it for cost or we want to focus on like latency. So why this is important and why it needs to be discussed is because LLMs, I mean at least um, when I made this presentation, at least since then, they've always had a very limited context. I know right now after Gemini breaking the internet with like 1.5 million tokens, it seems, I mean, people were like, oh, we can put everything in like one chunk and we can just forget about, you know, RAG completely. But time and again, we need to be reminded of that more uh, is the context size or the, uh, if you add more context to your prompts uh, that you're using to interact with your LLM, that is basically going to cost you more. So which is why it makes much more sense to focus and understand that what is the stuff that you need to basically focus on more. So smaller chunks are easier uh, to, most, uh, to find most of the relevant information with reference to the lost and middle problem. And it is something which uh, also would save you from over-processing the chunks, like uh, over-processing, it seems uh, like sometimes, you know, people are creating very small chunks. So which means that without using overlaps, one chunk would never get to know about the next chunk. So the information and the flow and the meaning of that text is basically split into multiple chunks, which is why we don't get relevant information as well. So apart from that, chunking obviously saves you cost because you can um, you know, make your responses as focused, as specific as you want. And let's not forget, LLMs are built by the context size. So why data processing evaluation or chunking strategy needs to be discussed as well is because um, we need to know that how often do we need to process our um, data? Uh, how do we pre-process it? What should be a chunk splitting strategy? Uh, what should be a chunk size? What should be the overlap if we need to use any? And apart from that, how do we even compare the results? So there's this one tool that uh, has been of a great help to me. Uh, and uh, that is uh, something which is used for visualizing the chunks. So you can basically use it. You can uh, also add your own uh, chunking strategy as well. So as of now, it supports uh, the chunking strategies which are available in Langchain practically. So these uh, color-coded you know, schemes, they would guide you as to how each of your chunk is going to look like. So that would basically give you an idea if your information is getting split across the chunks or it's actually uh, kind of you know, coexisting 
so that it would make more sense for the uh, retrieval algorithm to retrieve them to generate the response as per the user query. So the retrieval evaluation, I think that has been like the topic of the century, I would say, because I think a lot of people have been researching, and I think we have a lot of people here in this room who have been literally given their entire careers in uh, retrieval evaluation because it's subjective, it's dependent on domain, it is very contextual, it is based on query understanding. We need to find what metrics are going to be suitable for this particular use case, and on top of it, cherry on the cake is uh, now the multimodal as well. So we could start with something like mean average precision or go forward using uh, DCG or NDCG, something very standard that we used in our information retrieval problems as well. We could also use like F1 scores or semantic similarity. The idea being that we need to build an evaluation data set for ground truth. So on the subject of evaluation data set, I mean, again, I've uh, provided the link for the Git repo. Uh, where I provide you with uh, the uh, practical implementations, which can be um, basically used if um, you're trying to build evaluation data set to evaluate your uh, RAG or LLM-based applications. So I've used something like uh, T5, which is practically free. The other strategies basically use uh, OpenAI in the end, and I've also provided like um, a method or a small um, subroutine where you can use OpenAI prompts to build your own evaluation data set. There's something like FiddleCube AI as well, which I came across like two or three weeks ago, which I found like pretty um, amazing because it uses uh, LLMs in the back end, but uh, doesn't cost you anything. Along with that, we have amazing evaluation um, frameworks like Ruggers and Deep Eval, which also come along with synthetic text data generation. The catch here being that they also use OpenAI and they would require OpenAI key to build one of those. So the idea being that evaluation data set should ideally look like a question, a context based on which the question should be answered, and a ground truth, which is basically like the answer that your LLM should generate. Along with that, we can also uh, have something like evolution type and metadata that would help you assess uh, the capabilities like based on the simple answers or reasoning-based answer or multi-context uh, question and answers. So for the LLM prep part of this, uh, obviously you must be wondering like, okay, so embedding model has been taken care of, data uh, processing strategy has been taken care of, and retrieval strategy is probably taken care of as well. But in the end, the response needs to be generated by LLM. How do I evaluate that? So that goes uh, very similar to like a leaderboard approach that I've also adopted and I can recommend like a starting point of this. Of course, uh, you can use evaluation frameworks as well uh, as a complete entity to see if the LLMs are fit for the purpose or not, but then that could be a good starting point. And uh, for LLMs, basically, there are some semantics of the information that makes much more sense. Like, for example, ARC, Hellaswag, MMLU, and I'm sure... For some, this must be sounding gibberish, which is why I broke it down here on the next slide, that these benchmarks are basically based on the Luther AI language model evaluation harness, and ARC focus on advanced question answering with deeper reasoning. So for example, if your uh, use case requires something like reasoning-based question answer or interactions, it makes sense to focus on um, a LLM that performs well on the ARC um, metric. Hellaswag is something that basically uh, challenges the LLMs with diverse common sense reasoning tasks as well, something like an extension of ARC as well. And uh, this is something that should be used if you're expecting that uh, for your use case uh, to be uh, dealing with. MMLU is something that resembles like human way of learning. So if you're building something like a customer chatbot, it makes sense to look at these. Truthful QA is, as the name suggests, it's, it's a focus on how truthful my answers are based on the diverse uh, context. And another thing which probably is something that most of us ignore is license, because sometimes you know, models may claim that we are open um, for the public use, but their license is kind of you know, restricting. Apart from that, we can focus on number of parameters and average of all of these scores uh, that should be focused on as well. So the response evaluation could basically uh, evaluate based on these metrics. You could build your own, you could focus on RAG triad, and I think a lot of uh, um, RAG evaluation frameworks are focusing on something like using LLMs as judge, which has been a very, I would say, um, sweet and sour fight because LLMs as judge do not scale linearly, and which is why a lot of frameworks have trouble explaining the answers, which is the basic, 
I would say, need for such an application. Apart from that, human evaluation is something that could be used as a last stage, but it's expensive, which is why I've kept it in the end. So there are obviously some pre-built frameworks as well. You can check out this uh, repo that I was talking about. This is purely like an individual work. I've been running a couple of workshops as well with all of these platforms, uh, Quotient AI, uh, Ragas, and Rise. There are like end-to-end um, -end, you know, um, like, um, notebooks that you could be um, leveraging to see uh, how you can basically uh, improve your LLM-based applications. So I've covered like different strategies by uh, increasing, decreasing retrieval windows, by changing LLMs, by changing embedding models, by applying uh, retrieval uh, re-ranking techniques as well. So I know this could sound a lot, uh, which is why um, I thought maybe I should build a Git repo that talks about this. And apart from the other ones that I've shown, uh, there are many more like Langsmith and Galileo, Athena AI, um, Confident AI, which is Deep Eval, Aporia, and Godrail, and there are many, many, many more. I mean, I'm surprised myself, like, how many of these are coming up. The basic idea being that what matrix are relevant for your use case, that is what you need to figure out. Uh, how do you interpret the metrics and the scores, and how do you improve all of these um, metrics, basically? So, which is what I understood was one of the biggest challenges, uh, which is why this is something that uh, the Git repo could help you with, that... Uh, what is it that we were trying to build, and how did we decide the metrics? So overall, these are like some of the metrics that you could focus on uh, by making sure that uh, your context is as relevant to your um, um, on the answer that you're going to be generating. And from the generation um, aspect, like how relevant your answer, how faithful uh, the answer, uh, in um, some trying to say that uh, we're not really kind of uh, showing a hallucinating answer to the user. Apart from that, there are some platforms here that also you know, measure the bias and toxicity, and some that also support like custom evaluation parameters as well. So it would be great uh, to check those out as well. Apart from that, that was the end slide, and uh, this is the Git repo that I was talking about earlier. As you can see, like my main focus has been providing something visual. So I've tried to compare like different strategies um, in form of the experiments. And as you can see, I also describe at each of the notebook that I'm going to be experimenting with the next, uh, like for example, changing the embedding model because this is what I noticed in the previous experiment. So there are uh, some that are available and also with the synthetic Q&A where you can use these strategies to build your own custom um, evaluation data set. Apart from that, I guess that was probably what I had to cover today. <laughs>